A lot of you probably know who Empresaria are, so we, we won't spend too much time giving background, but there's just a couple of slides at the beginning to give you an understanding of, of who we are, what we do, and where we're operating. We are an international specialist staffing group following a multi-branded strategy to address global talent shortages. International means we are working in 20 different countries with 18 different brands. Specialist multi-branded is important. Each of our brands is a sector expert, so they have a niche focus uh, in their own sector. They are the experts in their markets, which means they understand the needs of clients and candidates and can therefore provide a quality service to both. In terms of where we're operating, we have four main geographic regions that we cover, the UK, continental Europe, Asia Pacific and the Americas. Overall, 71% of our net fee income, which is effectively gross profit, is coming from the four largest staffing markets in the world, those being the US, Japan, the UK and Germany. Overall, the global staffing market is worth over 400 billion euros, and of that, 67% of it comes from temporary and contract work. Our bias overall for temporary is 60%, and that's important because temporary and contract tend to be less cyclical throughout the economic cycle, so there's less volatility. And over time, we want to get that percentage up to 70. So it's in line with the global trend and the global overall percentage. The other statistic on here that's important is 87% coming from specialist and professional services. That means we are selling solutions to our clients rather than following pure volume at a low price. So that's really important with our sector specialist strategy. So we're going to be talking to you today about why we think it's a good investment to invest in Empresaria. And there's four key areas that we'll take you through. Firstly, there's our strategy. And that's around building, uh, developing brands, leading brands in the, in the sectors. If you look back 10 years, we had 33 brands. And that has now fallen down to 18. And the, the idea is to develop brands that can be a leading player in their sector. And that's about developing them to develop scale and coverage in the sector that they're operating in. We look at sharing best practice across a number of areas such as marketing, technology, processes to help the brands to develop. And it's about providing investment for them to grow and to extend their coverage. We're diversified by geography and by sector, and that means we're not reliant on any one market, and that's really important for us. We have an experienced management team in place to be able to, to deliver the strategy, and our business model is people-focused that helps attract and retain staff through an equity incentive model that we'll go through in more detail later. And also importantly to highlight is we're very highly cash generative as a sector. So when you look at the strategy, we've made very good progress in the last five years developing the, the group, not only from a financial point of view, but also putting in place a strong platform to be able to deliver the next phase of growth. If you look at the financials, our net fee income has grown 58%. The APBT is our adjusted profit before tax, and that's up 139%. And CR is our conversion ratio, which is another key measure for us. And that's effectively operating profit as a percentage of gross profit. And that's up to 16.7%. Now, those three numbers in 2017 are the highest level for the group ever. So we've got record figures at the end of 2017. When we look at what's happened to the, the company and the share price in 2017, we failed to meet the market expectations for the full year, and that obviously hit the share price. So we've seen a drop at the moment, with the shares currently at around the ATP level. Now, what we're explaining at the moment is why we think that that drop is overdone. When you look at the results that we delivered in 2017, it was still a record profit level. And we believe that we've proven the resilience of our model, because even though we had particular issues in Germany in the second half of the year, we were still able to deliver growth and were still able to deliver record profits. In Germany, there was a specific issue with new regulations that came in. Um, this put a limit on the amount of time a temp worker could be working in a company to 18 months and also equal pay 
coming in after nine months. That's had a short-term impact on the market and our business there. We believe that this is a short-term impact only, and we have a lot of experience of seeing how this plays out in other territories around the world over the last 20 years. And therefore, we've seen that markets adjust pretty quickly. So where there are changes in legislation, you don't tend to see that uh, to having an impact for more than you know, 18 months, or six, six to 18 months. So we expect to see a short-term impact in 2018 and then see an improving picture after that. So overall, our net fee income has increased 58% over the last five years. There's a lot of focus in 2017 on the low organic growth. I think it's important to show here that actually we've delivered 25% growth over that five-year period from organic growth with 41% coming from investments and an offset of 8% from divestments. So again, we're proving that the model is working and the strategy is delivering growth. And that 25% has come about even though 2017 was a low growth organically. So we've been consistent in delivering growth and organic growth is a priority for us and will continue to be so going forward. We've also delivered record profit levels and our adjusted profit before tax has been at a record level for the last three years consecutively. So again, we see that as evidence that our strategy is delivering um, and it has delivered well for us over the last five years and we don't see any reason for that to change going forward. We've also seen an improving conversion ratio, albeit that the growth rate has slowed, but that's to be expected because we're investing in the business and we're continuing to make those investments and those investments will help to grow the organic growth in the future. But that remains a, a target as well to continue seeing improvement in the conversion ratio. Because we're continuing to invest, we're looking at how we can look at new office openings. Um, in 2017, for example, we opened in Vietnam and we've seen a number of openings over the last five years across the UK, Southeast Asia, and Europe. Also, we're looking to invest in staff, and that's both hiring new staff and also training them. And we have, on average, last year, at about 1,400 people across the group. And finally, it's looking at the use of technology. This is something that's coming in uh, much more importantly, and, and it's a, a new phenomenon coming through into the sector. And it's somewhere where we're looking as a focus at the centre of the group, to identify new tools that can be used across the group companies to improve their efficiency and their effectiveness. And we think by having that focus at the centre, we can free up the time of our management teams to be able to focus on the selling and providing candidates, and we can then look at what best practices around the group. So we'll also look at the changes in the management team. First of all, I'd like to explain that actually as a board, we have considerable experience within the sector. We also will have a track record of dealing with issues and tackling problems that arise. So we're not afraid to make difficult decisions. And if you look back in 2017, we ended up merging two of our lower performing brands in the UK into our leading brands in, that, in those sectors. So if things are not working, we'll make changes. and We have a track record of doing that. Uh, we've also had a change in the senior management team over the last uh, six months, so I'm now presenting here as a CEO rather than the FD. But we believe that that process was a smooth, managed process. Also, um, just to stress that there is no change in strategy. Um, I was working very closely with Yoast as the ex-CEO, uh, working with him for over eight years, developing that strategy. So it's something I believe in. I'm not looking to change it. So it's an evolution rather than a revolution. Uh, obviously, there will be the odd tweak. I have my own ideas on things, but the overall strategy remains the same. We also benefit from Yost remaining uh, as a consultant within the group. So he's no longer on the board and he's no longer full time, but he is supporting us in Germany as a consultant to provide his experience and his knowledge to help us in what is our largest profit contributor in the group. And that's really important. When we made the statement at the AGM, we said that we weren't looking to replace the COO role at the board level, but that doesn't mean that we're not investing in the group. So we have no intentions to build a large central team and to increase the cost significantly, but we will continue to invest and build the central 
functions and build the experience levels as we continue to grow the group. Also, we're currently finalising a new five-year plan and we hope to be able to present that with our interim results in August this year. I'll now pass over to Tim to explain on the business model. Thank you, Spencer. Um, so I'm going to talk through our people-focused business model. So there are four key elements to this. So firstly, the multi-brand strategy. So 18 brands, 20 countries. This allows us to utilize the local expertise, both in terms of geographies, but also market in those businesses. Uh, secondly, which is, this is one of the key parts, is the, the, the management equity model. So local management have a stake in their business, not in Empresario PLC, but in their business. This ensures we align their interests with our shareholder interests. Um, and of course, it helps ensure we retain those people within the business and they are part of you know, our key driver for growth is, is, is the people, that's the, you know, they're the people in the people-focused business model. At the moment, we have uh, 51 members of management across the business who've got a stake in their business, and there's only one brand at the moment where no one has that, so we're, we've got it in place uh, across the group. Uh, thirdly is the focus on growing and uh, sort of emerging markets, so we've built up a large presence in both Asia and Latin America, together they account for more than 40% of our net fee income now. Uh, and as Spencer mentioned previously, we've got the bias towards temporary recruitment. So at the moment we're at around 60%, looking to increase that up towards 70. And uh, that provides more stability through the economic cycle for our sort of cash flows. Um, so just talking a little bit through more through the, the management equity philosophy. Um, so as I say, that allows the decentralized structure to work effectively. Uh, local management take more responsibility for what they're doing. They have their, their skin in the game, if you like. Um, as I say, it helps us to attract and retain key staff. But as Spencer, men Spencer mentioned earlier, if changes are needed, as we did in a couple of businesses last year, we do have control. We are able to make those changes. Uh, the management directors have come in place when we bought a business. They've shown their, their track record of growth. So this structure enables them to continue to demonstrate that as they become part of the Empresaria group. And as I say, shareholder interests are aligned, long-term thinking to grow value over time. We're not, uh, we're not incentivizing people with short-term incentives, it's their long-term equity interest. And I think uh, a key point really here is that this, this model, not just the management equity piece, but the, uh, the, the brand diversification, sex diversification, geography diversification, and the, and the, and the uh, equity model is a real key differentiator for us from our peers. So just moving on to the, the cash generative business element. So um, we used debt to finance the investments we made in 2016. So you can see from the chart at the bottom that net debt increased through 2016 and through 2017 because there was a deferred consideration element that meant that the debt increased then as well. However, we do now expect that to reduce as we move through 2018. Um, our longer term target remains to reduce our adjusted net debt to debtors ratio to 25%. Adjusted net debt is our statutory net debt number, but removing uh, pilot bond cash. So in the Rishworth business, uh, we collect bonds from the pilots which get released over their three year contracts. Um, but that is cash that while uh, it is cash, it is our cash, legally we can use it. Uh, it's not cash we would normally look to, to be using. So we strip it out in our adjusted net debt measure. Uh, so over time, we're looking to reduce that to 25%. Um, however, we've got a good level of undrawn facilities at the moment uh, across our RCF, uh, overdrafts, and our invoice financing facility, and we are comfortably within our covenants. And the temporary staffing basis, again, means that if we were to hit a downturn, we would expect our working capital to unwind, so we wouldn't expect a big impact on net debt. So taking all those things together, that means we are, you know, we are very comfortable with our current debt levels. Um, yes, over time, we're looking to reduce the net debt to debtors ratio. However, our strong financial position gives us the flexibility to invest if the right opportunities come along. So we don't need uh, to focus purely on paying down that debt. We can use our cash flow to invest. Uh, just a little chart here showing that um, we have very strong cash generation. It's aligned to profit. We have relatively limited um, capital requirements. 
and this has enabled us to pursue a progressive dividend policy in recent years. So the dividend has increased in each of the last four years, although it's still at a relatively modest level. Um, and the strategy continues to be to invest in the business. Um, preference would be to use equity, uh, provided the share price was right. But we have the, the financial strength to use our cash flows and our debt to do so if we need to. Okay, and you're back to Spencer. So just to finish off, we'll give a summary of what we see the main investment case being. Our strategy and business model is focused on growth, and it's a strategy that has served us well over the last five years. It has delivered strong growth for the group, and we believe we're in a position to continue that going forwards. It's a priority to focus on organic growth, not just external investments. As Tim was just saying, that strategy remains dual focus on both growing what we already have and supplementing that with, it, with new companies coming into the group. We also want to improve our conversion ratio over time, so that's about improving the operational efficiency of the business. We are diversified and balanced across sectors and geographies. That's important because we're not reliant on any one sector. Markets move at different rates, and you don't have the same, you know, markets moving all at the same time at the same rate, so it's important to have that balance and offset growth in one area if there's a decline in another. So we'll continue to follow a strategy of being diversified across our group. We're also multi-branded. That's important in a people business. We will continue to invest in our brands to grow them, to develop them. And that's looking at opening offices, investing in people, looking at where technology can come in to improve the efficiency of our operations. And finally, with our in incentivized management, our equity philosophy, both attracts people in the first place and also helps to retain them, which is really important to both allow us to run a decentralized structure, but also in a people business to be able to tie them in for the long term and align the interests with us as the majority shareholder. So when we look at what the business has done over the last five years, the platform we have in place at the moment and the future plans that we have, we're very excited about the prospects for the group and we're very happy to deal with any questions you have now. Does each individual brand finance their contractor book or does the group do that uh, in terms of candidates being paid heavy sums against when the invoice is paid by the client? And uh, does each individual brand have some stronger in their contractor perm ratio of billings against others or is it generally 60-40 across the board? I'll, I'll do the second one first. So there's a mix across the group. So in some countries, Specifically, when you look at the Asia market, the Southeast Asia market, it's pretty much 100% perm. In Germany, for instance, it's probably about 95% temporary. So around the group, there are very different percentages. And even in some countries, different brands will have different percentages in terms of perm and temp split. So there is a mix. When we look at funding the contractor book, we want each brand to have their own funding in place. So they will have their own facility. But saying that, we will use group relationships with banks to make sure that we're getting the right deal and that we're getting the best pricing. But we want them to make sure they're managing that, that cash book, they're managing their debtors efficiently because it's in their company uh, and that will be affecting them in terms of the interest they're paying. And whether, whether we finance that through invoice financing or not does, does depend on the country because the, the maturity of that sort of financing does vary across the globe. So certainly places like the UK, Yes, that's, that's very available, it's you know, a very normal option. Uh, somewhere like, I don't know, Chile. Actually, we do have it in Chile. We do have it in Chile. I'll put a bad example. Uh, somewhere like Japan, though, uh, it's not as mature and actually to finance yourself that way wouldn't be as effective as either through a loan or through an overdraft. So it's, it's looking at the right financing options in each market. Thank you. So the, the impression I'm getting is that uh, there's a very solid platform uh, in which you can expand your existing brands, acquire new brands, and you can um, you know, have a continued you know, strong financial performance because of you know, the, the, the investment in and management of the platform that you've created. But is there something about the um, staffing markets, uh, either in the West or in the emerging markets, which uh, represents, makes them a, a really attractive market to be in so what I'm trying to say is that there's an efficiency angle and there's a consolidation angle, but is there something underlying in those markets that, for example, you mentioned, did you mention opening in Vietnam? Um, 
Well, yeah, yeah, we believe that staffing is an exciting area with good growth prospects. Um, with staffing, you get the benefit of both economic growth, which will drive demand, but also churn when people are moving between jobs. So the, your perfect market is when there is both factors going on. But even in a declining market from an economic point of view, you can still get churn and you still have pockets of growth. What's important is to find areas of potential growth, whether that's by sector or by geography. So we're always looking at new markets. Um, Tim was explaining as part of our business model, one of the areas of that, one of the pillars is to focus on growth markets. So it's looking at where there's potential to grow, whether that is yeah, geography wise, we say Vietnam, where you've got a strong growth in the economy and increasing middle class going on, and that is driving future growth. We think that'll be a strong market as well as looking at niche markets. So when we invested in console partners, for example, back in 2016, they're providing IT or IT um, staffing, but in the high growth areas of IT. So it's things like cybersecurity, it's internet of things, it's digital, it's telecommunications, rather than the old legacy IT systems. So it's, yeah, it's about picking the right areas clearly, but we've got a nice mix between established markets where you've got a large presence, a very large market, say the 71% coming from the four largest markets, but also good access to emerging markets across Asia and Latin America in particular. Did that answer the question? Uh, yes, thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, hi. Um, are there any signals that you're getting from the staffing data, as it were, globally, <laughs> that there's a, any kind of impending uh, economic collapse coming and if so would that warrant holding back on uh, further acquisitions? Uh, there's nothing that's coming through um, that suggests there's any slowdown. Um, what we're seeing is the forecast for staffing is actually very positive. So the staffing industry analyst which is a, a I think US based but global or international staffing forecasting firm they've come out with their own forecast recently which is very positive for the next two or three years. Now, clearly staffing does have a correlation with economic activity. And if there is a decline in any economy, you'd expect that to have an impact on staffing. Now, if you're in a, a, a particular niche sector, you can still avoid that, but generally there will, there will be some sort of impact. So at the moment, if you look globally, there are positive GDP signs across the, across the world. I mean, 2018 is quite an unusual year for seeing positive forecasts across pretty much all the established markets. There's always political uncertainty, uh, uncertainty, and that's something that's increased over the last few years, the likes of Brexit, the likes of legislation that come in in Germany and Japan, etc. So that's, that kind of counterbalances a little bit with the economic growth. Um, and of course, economy, economies go in cycles. So at some point, there will of course be a downward cycle, but at the moment, there are no signs of that anywhere. I think it's also typically fair to say that um, staffing grows uh, you know, normally quicker than GDP, particularly in these emerging markets where uh, you know, the staffing market itself is relatively immature. So as that becomes more mature and grows, it has the ability to grow at a greater rate than that country's GDP. So again, that's why we're focusing in those emerging markets. What operational, key operational measures do you use to see how your different brands are doing across the world? Well, as a group, we focus on our net fee income growth and the conversion ratio, because that is telling us how effective the brands are being at getting that top line growth into the bottom line. Within each brand, they will look at other factors such as their fill rate, their CV submission rate, their interview numbers, and the different brands will have different measures that they look at. So we don't have a kind of group-wide set of measurements that everyone reports on, other than the more financial. And we'll use the specific measures per brand. Yeah, and you talked about best practice uh, a little while ago. Is, is your aim to sort of standardise the processes across the organisation? With our model, um, we don't look to standardise as such because the management teams have equity stakes in their business, so they've got skin in the game they are running their business and they have autonomy to make the day-to-day -day decisions. So the, the decision as to kind of systems and processes will still be with them, but if we see inefficiencies, we'll look to help them improve them. If we see areas of best practice, we'll um, pass that around the group, we'll explain it to people, and you know, it's in everyone's interest to use things that are going to improve their business. 
So it's about explaining things that will support them rather than the kind of the stick approach. It's not about saying you have to use a particular system or change this process. It's about this will help your business. We've seen it work elsewhere. We can help you implement it. And therefore, it, it, you know, you're pushing against an open door with it. Uh, a, a general question. Um, you've got various businesses all over the world, uh, and you've been doing that for some years. What, when do you think that you will have to, say, enlarge your head office, or when do you think that you will become too stretched? You're, you're moving into lots of different areas, as well as physical areas and business areas. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the rationale for it is. Could you explain it? The, the rationale is to be diversified and not have all our eggs in one basket effectively. So it's about spreading risk. In terms of how we manage that, partly it's helped by the model that we're operating. By having management hold equity, there's an incentive for them to look at a long-term view. Um, we have a very close focus on their re reporting. They report monthly on a standardised format. So it's very easy for us to see what's happening and there are reports come in plus kind of ongoing meetings, etc. We continue to invest in the group. As I said on one of the slides earlier, we're not just kind of expecting to build the group with the same management structure that we have now. We're bringing in people, but it's about bringing people in with, that have got the right experience that can actually add value. So for instance, on the technology side, we have someone who's joined the group to look at that particular area and we're looking at then what support we need from an operational side of things as we grow the group further. So it's something that we continue to look at, but it's always balancing out building extra cost versus having the right structure in place. I mean, the structure you've got with your organisation is that you've got sort of unique businesses, controlled centrally, but separate. Yeah. Um, would selling them off at any point be considered as part of your options? We have divested of businesses in the past. Um, typically, it has been more kind of management buyouts where we're looking to either close down a business or have it exit in that format. We're not looking to bring in businesses that we can develop and then sell on. That's not the model. The model is about developing a staffing group. Um, so it's about bringing companies in that can grow within the group. If they're not growing, if they're not performing, then either we need to change the management and improve it to merge it within one of the other brands that we have or to effectively exit it and divest. So the strategy is not find something, grow it, sell it on, and then use that money to invest in something else. It's find good companies, bring them in, help develop them and grow the whole group. Thanks, Tim. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.